Hey, if you've been coming along to Arise for any number of years now, you would know exactly what I'm about to read out. I look forward to Easter for many reasons. One of them is because I get to tell you my funniest and most favourite joke of all time. (laughs) A man and his wife and his mother-in-law went to the Holy Land. And while they were there, the mother-in-law passed away. The undertaker told them, you can have her shipped home for $5,000... Or you could bury her here in the Holy Land for 150. The man thought about it for a while and told him he'd just have a ship home. The undertaker was dumbfounded. He said, why would you spend $5,000 to ship your mother-in-law back home when you could have her buried here in the Holy Land for only $150? The husband replied, look, a man died and was buried here 2,000 years ago. And three days later, he rose from the dead. I just cannot afford to take that chance. Thank you for laughing, even those of you that have laughed over the last seven years as I've said the same joke on Easter. But it is a cracker, it is a cracker. And we are here this morning to celebrate and to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you've got a Bible there, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1 to 8. (coughs) Paul the Apostle writes this, he says, Now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. It's interesting, I love how Paul, he mentions that a few times in his letters about uh, the message, whether it be a letter that he wrote or a message he preached, but he makes this mention that you received it as well. So sometimes it's not enough just to hear something, is it? You've you've got to receive it. There's, There's a part that the messenger does in delivering it to you, but there's a part you pay in receiving that message as well. Paul says, I preached it to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. So there's a message that he gave them, that they've taken their stand on. He says, by this gospel you are saved. In other words, by this message, by this good news I preach to you, you've taken your stand on. That message you've taken your stand on, by that you've been saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you believed in vain. Verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. In other words, this is the most important thing. It's not the runner, by the way. I'm sniffling, same thing. You hear songs and you remember God. And oh, Excuse me. Oh. Verse 3. <laughs> Should have put it down in the front or something, shouldn't I? On the sleeve and pocket. Yeah, it's gross. I'd forget it and it'd be through the washing. Then never be mad at me because their clothes are covered in my tissues. It's safest down here. Verse 3, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. In other words, the most important message, the message upon which you're standing firmly, that message through which you've been saved, is this message, that Christ died according to what the prophets spoke of hundreds of years before it ever happened. And he was buried and he raised again, again, something that's not new, People told you that this was going to happen hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. He says that Christ was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Then he goes on, he says something quite remarkable. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then finally he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. The gospel Paul preached, the message that he carried to the known world at the time was this simple message that Jesus Christ was buried according to what the prophets said, uh, crucified according to what the prophets said hundreds of years ago, that he was buried, and that he was raised again from the dead, which we were told about hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. In other words, God has been prepping humanity for this moment in time where Jesus would come and would be crucified, would be buried, and three days later would do something that nobody else had ever done and would raise from the dead. Don't act so surprised, you people, because God gave you a forewarning hundreds of years ago through your own prophets. He told you that this is what was going to happen. Our message is a message that revolves around the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. This is our message. This is the reason why the church exists. This is the reason why we have the hope of eternal life. This is the reason why we believe in the power of Jesus' death. 
This is the reason why we can be free of the fear of death, because Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead. Amen. Isn't that a good message this morning? It's good news. It's good news for us. You see, Jesus' life alone was not enough to truly transform his disciples. How many of you know that? How many of you have read the, the historical accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And let me just say, when, when, when the gospel writers sat down and penned these ancient documents, none of them thought they were writing a religious book. Have you ever thought about that? None of them thought they were writing a religious book. They weren't writing these things down going, I can't wait till I think it's 400... Uh, AD, whatever, when um, uh, I can't remember who it was who actually gathered all these ancient documents together and said, let's get copies of them and let's compile them in a book and give them a leather-bound cover and let's make sure that everybody gets a copy of it. That was hundreds of years after these guys wrote these letters. When these guys wrote these letters, when Matthew, Mark, Luke, John sat down and, and spoke to eyewitnesses or, or recalled to memory what they'd experienced, none of them were writing thinking, one day this will be bound together and stuck in a religious book. What they were writing was historical fact according to the way they understood it and the way they had investigated it and what they knew to be true. So it's important when we read these letters that we don't think we're reading some religious book. They were never intended. They've become a religious book because over time we've turned them into religious writings. But when they were written at the time, they were not written at all with these writers going, we're going to write religious writings or, or put down a religious book. They were writing historical fact. These are facts. These are things that we can verify. We have seen them with our own eyes. We heard them with our own ears. Or we spoke to people who experienced them firsthand. And so we're documenting history. So keep that in mind as I continue to talk this morning. We're not talking about stuff in religious writings. We're talking about historical fact. People that wrote from a historical basis who did their research, not from a religious writings perspective. Jesus' life alone was not enough to truly transform his disciples. How many of you know they ran at his moment of weakness, at his moment of, 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 of time that came where he was being taken by the soldiers in the garden? His disciples ran. They fled. These people that were so gung-ho that followed him around that cheered him on, his cheer squad, as he did miracles and confounded the wise and so on, these people took off and left him at the moment when the, when the soldiers took him. In other words, his life, as interesting as what it was, probably changed their lives, but it didn't transform them. It didn't transform them. Jesus' crucifixion didn't transform them. Even the sight of an empty tomb was not enough to transform them. It probably changed them in some way, but it didn't transform them. In Luke chapter 24, verse 12, it says, Peter, however, got up and he ran to the tomb after he'd been told that it was empty. He ran to the tomb, bending over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away wondering to himself what had happened wondering what had happened. I mean, Jesus had already told him he was going to do this, but they still didn't believe. And so even though the tomb is there empty and the linen strips are there, it wasn't enough to transform Peter. He just went away and wondered to himself, I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened. Luke 24 verse 17. And he asks them, this is the road to Emmaus. Here are these two disciples, followers of Jesus, who've heard that the tomb was empty. And so they're recalling the story and they're having a chat while they're walking towards Emmaus by themselves. And a person, a stranger, interrupts their chat. They didn't realize at the time, but it was Jesus. And here's what happened. Jesus, this guy, they didn't know who he was. He asked them, why are you discussing to get, what are you discussing together as you walk? They stood still, their faces downcast. Why were their faces downcast? Here's why their faces were downcast. Verse 22, you pick up the story. They're telling this person, this is why our faces are downcast. This is why we're so solemn at the moment. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. In other words, we were told the tomb was empty. Friends of ours went and verified the tomb was empty. The people that first saw it was empty said they saw an angel, and the angel said he's risen. And we're walking around downcast because we still don't believe. You see, an empty tomb was not enough to transform people. It might have changed them. It got them thinking. An empty tomb warranted an investigation, but it was a resurrection that created transformation in the lives of these people. It wasn't until they saw the resurrected Jesus that these people were totally transformed. And praise God that happened because you and I wouldn't be sitting here this morning if that didn't happen. An empty tomb is worth an investigation, but it's a resurrected Jesus that calls for and creates 
transformation in people. John chapter 20, verse 19. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week, this is after Jesus is crucified, this is after they've been told the tomb is empty, this is after they're discombobulated, can't work out what's going on. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, the tomb is empty, we don't know what happened, people have seen an angel, they've told us that Jesus is alive, and we're still locking ourselves in a room in fear of the Jews. That doesn't sound like a transformed bunch of people to me. They haven't been transformed yet, but watch what happens next. Then Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be still. And from that moment on, we've got a totally different story, according to these historical documents, of what happened with those people when they encountered and they saw a resurrected Jesus. Even his own brother, even Jesus' own brother James, did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was. John 7, verse 5, tells us that even his own brothers did not believe him. But something happened within a few weeks of the resurrection in the life of James. We know that because in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, Luke records this in his historical account of the first 30 years of the church. He says, They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And with his brothers. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us what happened to James. He says that Jesus appeared to James. Something happened that transformed them. It wasn't an empty tomb, and it wasn't even the life and teachings of Jesus. It was an actual encounter. These people actually, physically, in reality, believed they had seen something. And they were convinced that the something they actually saw with their physical eyes in a natural world was a man who was crucified three days earlier and rose from the dead. And with that vision, with that picture of a resurrected Jesus, those people were totally and utterly transformed. You see, it was the resurrection that powered the movement that we call Christianity that they called back then the way. In fact, Jesus actually said that his resurrection was going to be the sign that he was going to perform for an unbelieving world. In John chapter 2, verse 18 to 22, the Jews then responded to him. And this is what they said to Jesus, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all these things that you're doing? And Jesus answered them, he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. They're standing with the temple in view, and they thought he was talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. And they replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he'd spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. Isn't that interesting? After he was raised from the dead, then they believed the scriptures. Then they believed the words he had to speak. It wasn't until after they encountered a resurrected Jesus that all the pieces fell into place for them in terms of their Christian experience and their Christian journey, if you want to put it that way. Matthew records a similar thing, Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 40. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. But none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said this to us. He said, the sign that I am who I said I am is not going to be healing a leper. It's not going to be raising another dead person. It's not going to be refuting the Pharisees. I'm going to do something that is irrefutable. I'm going to do something that you're not going to be able to work out. It's going to send your brain in a spin. It's going to be otherworldly. I'm going to predict my own death, burial and resurrection, and then I'm going to pull it off. Watch this space. And we're here this morning because apparently Jesus actually did it. He actually did it. Now here's something to think about. I heard uh, Pastor Andy Stanley say once, anyone who can predict his own death, burial and resurrection and pull it off, you should listen to everything else that guy had to say. <laughs> and I tend to agree with him. So we need to listen to what Jesus had to say. But Easter is a reminder that we actually have an event-based uh, event faith. Our faith has an anchor point in human history. It's the resurrection of Jesus. You know, the, I think it's the New King James Version of, of Hebrews 11, I think it is, says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I think many Christians, we feel like our faith, it, faith just means, oh, we just believe. Yet faith has substance. Faith has evidence. There are things that we can tangibly look at and grab a hold of and hang our faith on and give an account for why we believe 
what we believe. And I want to talk a little bit this morning about some reasons why I believe in the resurrection. You know, I wasn't there to see a resurrected Jesus. And I don't want to show of hands, but I'm going to guess that 99% of the people in this room, you haven't seen a resurrected Jesus. It was the resurrection, the proof of the resurrection that transformed the lives of the early believers. Now, what do you do generations on when we don't get to stand there and see a resurrected Jesus? Do we have no faith until we actually see a physical res resurrected Jesus in front of us? In which case, probably many of us in this room wouldn't be here. But I believe that there are other things that God has given to us and other ways that we can communicate to an unbelieving world why we believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I want to just give you a couple of things to think about this morning. If you believe in Jesus, I want you to think about these things because when somebody says to you, why do you believe in the resurrection? How many of you know that God operates differently with each of us? I don't believe in Jesus because he healed me once of something. Whether he healed me or not, guess what? 2,000 years ago, a guy was crucified, buried and resurrected whether I got healed or not. Whether I'm feeling happy or sad today, a guy was crucified, buried and resurrected 2,000 years ago. That's what my faith hinges on is in a moment in human history, not an emotion I feel right now. Not just because things went my way. I prayed a prayer and all of a sudden my life lined up and things looked good. That's not what it's about. If we're hanging our faith on things that are happening or not happening right now, we're missing the point. The early church, every time they communicated this message about Christ, they communicated about a moment in human history, something that actually happened. They said, that's where you need to hang your hat, is on this moment in human history. So I want to give you some things. Reasons why I believe that we can believe in the resurrection of Jesus and why it makes sense to me. Keep in mind, again, this is not a collection of religious writings. When these were written, they were historical artifacts, historical evidences, historical documents. People were writing down a history to pass on to generations. They didn't realise that in 400 years everybody was going to be able to get a copy of this in their own hands. They didn't realise that in the year 2021 you could go onto Google and Google whatever you wanted and find out whatever piece of information you want, even though probably a lot of it's wrong. <laughs> they weren't seeing that. They were living in a world where, 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 where traditions and stories were passed on orally. You spoke to the next generation and you told them. And then somebody would write down from, from recollection. Their memories were quite powerful back then because this is the world they lived in. They recalled things by memory. So their memory muscle was a lot stronger than what probably a lot of us have today because we just click buttons and find stuff and store stuff in here. They didn't have that. So they passed through oral tradition, their stories and the things that happened in the accounts and so on. Here, I want to give you some reasons why I think you should consider the reality of the resurrection. Number one, I can't fathom a lie that I'd be prepared to die for or one that I'd be prepared to start and watch others die for. If this story of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus is a lie, it's a cruel one. It's a cruel one. Because throughout the centuries, men and women have been physically beaten and literally killed for their faith in a story that was started by these guys just over 2,000 years ago. I personally can't think of a lie that I'd be prepared to tell that would cause me physical pain, let alone sit back and watch somebody else because physical pain by a lie that I started or a lie that I told. Yet that's exactly what's happened with this story about the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These guys, they recorded in history that this event actually happened and that people actually saw this resurrected Jesus. Paul, who we all know used to be Saul, in the first 30 years of the church, he was persecuting the church. He was killing Christians. And he had an encounter with a resurrected Jesus on a road as he was on his way to get more Christians to kill them because of their belief in Jesus. He had an encounter with a resurrected Jesus, transformed, changed his life. He went on to write two-thirds of what we call the New Testament now. Paul was beheaded in Rome, 67 AD. That's a high price to pay for a lie that you've perpetuated by writing two-thirds of the New Testament. I don't think Paul thought he was lying. I think Paul was convinced that what he encountered was an actual resurrected Jesus, the historical figure that went about Jerusalem teaching and preaching for three years, then was crucified, buried, and resurrected. Paul was so convinced that that was the guy that he encountered that he was beheaded before he would allow himself to turn around and say, no, that didn't happen. He was beheaded for his faith. Peter... Peter, the one that denied Jesus. You know, when the rooster crows three times, you're going to say, you don't know me. That guy that denied Jesus at the crowing of a rooster because a little slave girl come up and said, you're one of them, aren't you? And he denied Jesus. That guy was also killed. 
He was also crucified around the same time for his faith. Only Peter was so in awe of who Jesus was that history tells us when he was crucified, he asked them to put the cross upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus upright. So his, his, his cross was put in the ground upside down. That doesn't sound like somebody that knew what they were propagating was a lie. When I go back and I look at the historical stories, 11 out of the 12 original propagators of this message, 11 of the original 12 were martyred. That means they were physically killed for their faith. That means all they had to do was one thing, to not die. Say, it's not true. It's not true. And Paul would have got up and been let out of prison from Rome and gone on his merry way and had a wonderful life. Peter could have had a wonderful life. But they didn't say that. Thomas, who stood there at one point, even when the other disciples said, we've seen Jesus, Thomas said, unless I put my fingers in the holes, I'm not going to believe it. And then Thomas saw the resurrected Jesus. How convinced was he? He was that convinced that he got on a boat, went over to India, and history tells us he was martyred for his faith, taking this good news to the subcontinent of India. And he was killed for his faith. And there are men and women beyond that for thousands of years who to this very day are still being brutally bashed, beaten and killed and suffering loss for their faith. That's a cruel, cruel lie if there's no truth in it. But somewhere along the lines, people are believing it with such passion and such integrity that it's costing them. Think about this. The disciples had nothing to gain by starting this story about a resurrected Jesus. They had nothing to gain in the times in which they lived. They had nothing at all to gain by starting a rumour of a resurrected Jesus if it didn't happen. How often do you hear of people telling lies for personal gain? I mean, most of us in this room, you're good Christian people. I'm sure you wouldn't tell lies. But on the odd occasion, maybe you've, you've been tempted to tell just a little bit of a lie just for personal gain, maybe to make yourself look good or maybe to save a few bucks on your taxes. Or maybe to, to, to cuddle a relationship with somebody. Just a little bit of a, not a blatant lie, I'm just twisting things a little bit. But, but when I do that, or when we're tempted to do that, it's because there's some personal benefit. It might get me out of trouble or something. This lie got them in a stack of trouble. It got them in a stack of trouble. It isolated them and it put them on the hit list. The disciples had nothing to gain by telling a lie. The only conclusion I can come to is, they actually believed this story. To them, this was not a lie. It was real. Second reason, the original documented witnesses, all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, all four of them mentioned that the first person to see the resurrected Jesus was a woman. Now, if you go back and you look at the culture of that day, a woman's testimony basically meant nothing. In a court of law, a woman's testimony was pretty much invaluable. Only on very, very rare circumstances would a woman's testimony be accepted as valid. Most of the time, it was an invalid testimony back in that particular day. Now, if you want to start a lie, if you want to start a rumour about something that didn't happen, then, then, then wouldn't it make sense to use some kind of prominent figure as the first person that witnessed this incident? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you tack on some names of some prominent people or, or some people that, that even right now they might not believe you, but maybe in, in, in 50 years' time, uh, when this generation passes or 100 years, if it's in the books, maybe people will start believing it then. But the first people to see Jesus were women. And why would you record that the first people to see Jesus were women if you were trying to get some valid traction with the story? The only possible reason I could think of is because it was actually true. Matthew says it. Mark says it. Luke says it. Even John. All four of the writers mentioned that the first people to see the empty tomb, the first people, were women. Now, if you want to start a lie, then pick more credible witnesses as your, as your starting point. In the day and the culture that this was written, they were doing everything they could to undermine their own story. All I can think of is they must have actually believed that it was true. The third thing, the actual claim of an empty tomb. Considering the incredible disruption that this movement was already to the Jewish leaders and to the Romans in the day, wouldn't it make sense if they had a body for the Jewish leaders to simply produce the body? What about the Romans, the Romans who were in charge of the known world at the time? If they had knowledge of where the body was, why didn't they just produce the body? Or why didn't somebody come out and say, the body is over here, or the body is over there, or this person took it, or that? 
Why didn't they produce some kind of evidence? Did you know to this day there's no documented evidence about the whereabouts of Jesus' body? No documented evidence. Some people say that believing in the empty tomb uh, takes a great deal of faith. Let me tell you something. Based on the evidence that's actually available, it takes more faith to believe it wasn't empty. Based on the evidence. The problem is most of us have a bias towards faith or unbelief. And so we curdle towards that bunch of information and we forego the other side of the argument. But the truth is there's probably more evidence for the resurrection of Jesus as an answer for the empty tomb than there is for any other reason why that tomb was empty. There's no recorded evidence to this day of anybody finding an, uh, the body of Christ and saying this is where it is, it was moved there. There are theories and people have come out over the years, oh, we found this thing here to Jesus whose mother was Mary. By the way, Jesus and Mary was like John Smith and everyone says John Smith when we think of a common name, don't we? No one ever happens up with a girl's one, so I'm stumped. But uh, Jesus was a common name back in his time. Mary was a common name back in his time. But it's interesting, there's no documented evidence. If the Romans took the body, wouldn't they have documented something in an archive somewhere? If the Jewish leaders had the body, wouldn't they have documented something somewhere, knowing the problems that this movement was already causing them? They would have documented something there. The way that their world worked with their oral traditions and their history and so on, surely they would have documented something somewhere. But there's nothing that has been found. And why up until now has there been no evidence produced for the whereabouts of Jesus' body or evidence that verifies it was moved, transported or stolen? But there is a document, there is documented evidence that there was a tomb, that it was sealed by a Roman seal. And by the way, if you broke a Roman seal in the day, the punishment was death. You were killed for breaking a Roman seal. So if the followers did break the Roman seal, then the Romans would have gone nuts on the followers of Jesus and just killed them for breaking the Roman seal. But there's no evidence that they chased them down for breaking a Roman seal. They chased them down for propagating a message about a resurrected Jesus. It was covered by one and a half ton stone to two ton stone. We know that. It's documented historically. And it was guarded by at least 16 Roman soldiers. We know that historically. And it turned up empty. We know that too. Outside of that, we don't know too much. In fact, instead of producing a body, the best the authorities of Jesus' time could do is they came up with a lie to explain it. Matthew 28, 11 to 15 says, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city, reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were sleeping. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Matthew wrote this approximately 40 to 60 years after the death of Jesus. So 40 to 60 years after the death of Jesus, Matthew writes down in a historical account, this story is still being propagated because it was. Because it was. Notice in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul talks about the resurrection, he says he was seen by the disciples, then he was seen by this, seen by that. Then he says he was seen by over 500 people, most of whom are still alive today. You don't say that kind of stuff unless you're expecting someone to come back to you and go, really, most of them are still alive today? Give me a name. They're not trying to hide anything. All these guys were doing was writing down historically the facts of what actually happened 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. On another note, if somebody did have the body or if it was still in the tomb or someplace else, why didn't the authorities simply take Peter to the body once he began his great message in Acts chapter 2? Peter stands up in Jerusalem and he goes, Hey, oh, let me tell you about this Jesus who you crucified. They all knew who Jesus was. Why didn't somebody go, Peter, sit down, shut up. Here's the body. Here's what happened. Nobody refuted it and it caused great turmoil in the city because thousands turned to Jesus. Thousands turned to Jesus. Don't you think if you were the authorities of the day and you had some kind of evidence, no matter how weak it was, that would be your moment to bring it out and go, hang on a second, here's the counter-argument to that. They had no counter-argument because it happened. It actually happened and it's historically verifiable. Number four, the first place that the disciples preached after the resurrection. Why didn't the disciples go to Corinth? Why don't they go to Athens to preach? I mean, if, you're, if this is a lie and this is not real, then why don't you go to a place outside of Jerusalem? Jerusalem knows too much of the story of Jesus Christ. Jerusalem knows too much of the historicity of this man, Jesus. Jerusalem knows too much about Roman law, Roman rule. It knows too much about what could have happened, potentially, if the Roman soldiers did take the body or the disciples did take the body or the religious leaders did. I mean, Jerusalem is where all the secrets would be hidden. Why would you take this message straight back into the heart of Jerusalem and preach it first? 
Wouldn't you think that if you want to get some traction on this lie, take it to the easiest place first. If you want to tell a lie, who do you tell first? You go to the most gullible person first and you get a bit of traction with the lie. Don't go straight to the person who, who could potentially have the most information to refute your argument. You go somewhere else. Yet they took this message straight back into the lion's den, straight back into the heart of Jerusalem. Why would they do that? Probably because they believed it was true. They had nothing to hide. They weren't trying to, 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 to bring in little things to exaggerate. They were just giving the facts as it were. And here are the facts. Jesus Christ was crucified according to the scriptures. He was buried and three days later raised from the dead. Number five, the continued existence of the church, even in spite of all its failings, its imperfections, its failures of leadership and its failures of its members. I mean, if this... If this started on the basis of a lie, it's the greatest lie ever told. Because all around the world this morning, there are literally millions of people gathering to go over the lie once again and convince each other that it actually happened. Millions of people. How many times in human history have there been movements that have tried to kill this message of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. You can go to countless nations and, and times throughout history and you can see deliberate attempts to wipe this story from the history books. Yet here we are in 2021 celebrating a man who died, was buried, and resurrected 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years and they can't crush the message and they can't take the evidence away and they can't destroy the narrative. It's the truth. And here we are, sometimes as Christians, we sit here feeling like we're the gullible dumb ones. Hey, there's so much evidence for our faith, people. We don't need to hide quietly in a corner and just talk to each other. Hey, this is historically verifiable fact that Jesus was buried, crucified and raised from the dead. He takes as much faith to believe in the resurrection as it does to believe in an empty tomb. It takes as much faith to believe in Jesus as it does to not believe in Jesus. In fact, the historical evidence is stacked in our favour. That's exciting. That's exciting. The church, even the failings, the shortcomings, the fallings of God's people. How many people in this room are perfect? Apart from Rod. Maybe one over here. They've just proved two imperfections. They're proud. Pride's an imperfection, people. The point is this. Here we are 2,000 years later. And the movement is still going strong. I don't know any business that would last that long. I don't care how financially successful they are in one generation. Times change, technology changes, products change. And a business can go from the greatest thing to nothing, greatest to nothing. Movements come and movements go. But the church has been around for 2,000 years. It's been persecuted. It's been beaten. It's been told to shut up and sit in the corner. It's been told it's not valid. It's been told it's outdated. Yet we're still here, people. We're still here. Either this is the greatest lie ever told, or oh my goodness, it's incredibly good news. Jesus Christ was buried, crucified, buried, and resurrected for our sins. Hey, I want to show you a little bit of a clip here. And then I'm going to finish up. Any of you heard of a man called Jordan Peterson? Jordan Peterson is a clinical psychologist. He's a, I think he's the professor of psychology at Toronto University in uh, Canada as well. And in the last couple of months, I've been following a few things to do with Jordan Peterson. He's a dizzying intellect. And he's also a non-Christian. But God's been working on his heart. And I just want to show you a little clip before I finish up this morning of an interview he had about three, four weeks ago. It's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. I guess my last point for why I take the resurrection seriously is because of my own transformation, my own journey with God. And I would dare say your journey with God as well. I remember being 19 years of age and I remember, I remember feeling like if this is all there is to life, then what's the point? If what I can see, taste, touch, feel and smell is as good as it gets, it's not very good. Now, people around me would have said, no, it, yours is pretty good, Alan. I was never the kid with no friends. I was, I was very sporty. I knew a lot of people. I could be the life of the party. But deep down inside, I was empty. And I didn't know why. Because I had things that other people wanted that they thought would make them happy. 
But I used to go to bed at night time after being out with my friends and being at parties and I would lay my head down in my bed and I would cry myself to sleep. Because when the music was gone and the friends were gone and it was just me, inside I was so sad about my existence. And I couldn't work it out. One day I'd been out with my mates and we came home and I woke up one morning very early and I was living in a caravan at the time and I had a friend of mine asleep on the kitchen table, another guy on the floor, another guy, and there were just bodies all over my caravan. And I sat up in bed and I heard this voice, and this voice said to me, Alan, if this is all there is to life, why don't you end it? And it frightened me so much because it was the first time in my life where I realised if I had something within arm's reach of me right this second, I wouldn't be here today. I could do this. And that was the point where I began to ask questions and I began to put together the steps of my life. And one common theme was the message of this man called Jesus. I first heard this message when I was 12. And I started putting bits and pieces together and I started to think, well, God, if you're real, if you're real, then maybe you're that thing that's missing. Maybe you're that answer that I need. Maybe you're that missing part of my life. And it took me on a journey for a while. And one day, standing on a roundabout in the Pacific Highway, Ballina, with trucks and buses whizzing around me, I prayed a prayer. My prayer was this, God, I think you're there. I, I don't understand it all. I can't work it all out. I don't have all the answers. I've got more questions than answers, to be brutally honest. But God, I feel like I know enough to know that I think you're there. So God, would you take my life and the mess that it is and would you make something beautiful out of it? And that began a process for me. Peterson makes this statement. He says, it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it? Well, let me give you some things that have happened. You'll receive forgiveness for your sins. Because Christ died for your sins. To extend mercy so the Father could give mercy to you. He and you know sin. You're going to stand before God one day whether you like it or not, whether you believe in it or not. You're not going to be able to stand before him, close your eyes and say you're not there. He's going to be there. You've got two choices. You either hope that you've lived a good enough life where you tick every box and he goes into heaven. And I would advise that you don't take that chance because the standard's a little bit higher than you're going to be able to attain. Or you fall on your knees and you surrender your life to Jesus and you allow him to pay the price for the things that you've done wrong. You can receive forgiveness of sins. You can receive freedom from guilt and shame. Those things that we do, those things that we've done that hold us back, might have been this morning, might have been last night, could have been a year ago, 10 years ago. But they stick claws into us and they pull us back and they inhibit our ability to go forward. God wants to take the shame and the guilt away. You can be free from the fear of death. I can stand here this morning and, and, and say I'm not afraid to die. I, I'll, I'll, I'll meet Bevan's mother. I'm very confident of that when I pass from this life to the other. It doesn't mean I want to go anytime soon, but it means when I do go, I've got something better on the other side, not worse. What I'm going to be missing out on here is going to pale in comparison to what I'll gain when I get to the other side and I get to stand there with this resurrected Jesus Christ. You can get peace despite your circumstances, despite what's going on in your world. God wants to give you a peace deep down on the inside of your heart, a peace that's not stapled or attached to the circumstances of life. Some people get a lot of money in the bank account and they've got peace, and when the money's gone, they lose their peace. They get a pretty guy, pretty girl, they've got peace in their heart. As soon as they lose the relationship, they lose the peace. Jesus wants to give you a peace that's not attached to anything worldly. It's a peace deep down in your spirit that knows that you're reconnected with the creator of the universe, the lover of your soul and you'll be forever in his hands. He won't let you go. That's the kind of peace God wants you to know, a kind of peace that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can have, I can have not. I can be up here, down there. I can do it all. Why? Because the most important thing is that I've got Jesus with me. I've got Christ with me. He offers you power to become all you were created to be and the ability to do everything that he puts you down here to do and an assurance that you have eternal life with God when you leave this earthly realm. I want everyone just to close their eyes for a second. Just close your eyes. I'm not going to make a big hoo-ha or a big deal of this. I'm a big believer that our faith is not expressed by sticking a hand up in a meeting or by saying a prayer. Our faith is expressed by the very next step you take after you make the decision to follow. Where are you walking? But I just want to ask a simple question. Is there anybody here in this room this morning? And you know that you need Jesus. You know that you need Jesus. I want to tell you something. It makes not only spiritual sense, but it makes intellectual sense to follow Christ. And if you want to know more about that, come and see me. I can point you in some directions of some great authors, some great teachers, some great resources to help you on that journey. But here's the thing. You're never going to know enough 
to take that step of faith. That's why it's called a step of faith. My journey is such that when I took that step of faith, things started to fall into place and make sense afterwards that didn't make much sense before. But I had to come to that place of faith. God will never get you to a point where you don't need faith because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Is there anybody in this room this morning and you would love to reconnect yourself with God? I'm not going to call you up the front. I'm not going to make you say a prayer in front of everybody. I'm not going to point you out. Just as one simple, your first act of faith, I just want you to raise your hand and put it back down again. That's all you need to do. It's your way of saying, yep, God, that's me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Well, Father, we thank you for this morning, God. And Father, we want to thank you for the uh, evidence, God, that exists for the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. God, each of us in this room are a piece of evidence that points towards something that happened 2,000 years ago. And so, Father, I pray as we go into this next week, God, I pray for each person here that believes in you. God, I pray that we would walk out of this room with a, a greater degree of boldness and confidence in our life that, God, we're not just believing in fables and fairy tales. God, today is a reminder that 2,000 years ago, something happened, a physical, historical uh, incident took place where a physical, historical man by the name of Jesus, who was the Son of God, was crucified on a Roman cross, nails driven through his hands and his feet. He was taken down, he was buried in a tomb, and three days later, people went to that tomb, the tomb was empty, and that man, Jesus, showed his physical body to a bunch of people that went on to change the world. So Father, I thank you for that story and we thank you for the reality of that. And each person as we go from here this week, God, let us have a, a new degree of boldness and confidence in what we believe because we know that it's true. We know that it's true. And Father, in the next seven days, would you give each of us a chance to share that message with somebody, God? Somebody who up to this point, they don't know that story. They don't know the reality of Jesus. They just know what they see, taste, touch, feel and smell. God, give us a chance to take this good news and to share it with the rest of the world, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Uh, bless you guys. Hey, look, you can, you can grab a tea and a coffee if you would like. Uh, and just make sure you grab your tea, coffee, chuck the chairs wherever you want, sit down, continue to have a chat with each other. Uh, have a fantastic week, and God willing, next week we'll have worship back up and masks will be removed. So bless you guys.